Page 189, Exercise 6. The first is the structural functionist perspective. This proposes that crime, and especially increases in crime, are a result of social disorganization as a result of the loss of shared values and norms and an erosion of social control. These ideas are based on Robert Merton, who was a very famous sociologist. And if this is what we think are at the root of crimes, then we would expect increases in crime to occur when there's rapid social change, when there's a great deal of immigration or industrialization or an increase in poverty. In fact, in Canada, it's interesting, if we take a look at the number of murders per 100,000 people, it is far lower on the East Coast than on the West Coast. And we can use this theory to explain this change from East to West, because we can say that the Eastern part of Canada it's been settled for several hundred years, especially the Atlantic provinces. All the people that are residents there tend to share a similar culture. But as you go to the Western provinces, they've been settled more recently by groups of people from very many different cultures. There is still a great deal of migration to the western provinces, so we would expect the West to be less organized for there to be less shared values and ideas, and therefore there will be more crime. We can use this structural functional approach and also look at other countries, and we would expect countries which are quite homogeneous, such as Japan and Korea, to have lower crime rates while societies or countries which are changing quite rapidly, think of South Africa, those countries should have higher crime rates. And in fact, we do find some of this, which will lead us to the conclusion that yes, this is a good way to try to understand some of the causes of crime. But it isn't going to tell us everything about the causes of crime. We have to use a second theory. This is the conflict theory, based on the original ideas of Karl Marx, in which crime is a manifestation of the conflict between the classes in any society. In other words, crime is caused by inequality. And that makes sense. If everybody was equal in Canada, there would be a lot less crime, obviously. As well, this theory draws our attention to the fact that laws are social constructs. They're created and they can change, as we've already discussed. But they tend to be created primarily by the people in positions of power, by the wealthy, powerful people in any society, and therefore those laws are going to protect the interests of that group. Think about the kinds of laws we have in Canada. A great many of the laws we have in Canada and the U.S. and other capitalist countries deal with property rights. What belongs to whom? What happens if property or capital is transferred? And these types of laws tend to work to the advantage of the people who do have a great deal of capital or property, 
and don't work as much to the advantage of those who are poor. Clearly, you already know that individuals who are wealthy have the ability to influence the legal system, to purchase the very best legal advice, to influence the way decisions are made. And there are examples from everyday occurrences where we know that the law treats people of different classes differently. Just some examples about this. In Canada, 12% of the people in prisons in Canada are Aboriginals. But Aboriginals are only 3% of Canada's population. So it could well be that because Aboriginal peoples are at the bottom of the class structure, they tend to be unfairly treated by the the legal system. In the U.S., 41% of those prisoners on death row are black, but blacks comprise only 12% of the U.S. population. Again, we see great inequalities in the way that different groups in society are treated, and these are the kinds of things we tend to learn when we use the conflict theory to understand crime.